Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Monte Carlo lecture series. It's a great pleasure to have today Dr. Dinesh Kalra, who will be speaking about Faber's disease advances in diagnosis and therapy. Dr. Kalra is the Division Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine and the Vice Chair of Quality in the Department of Medicine. He's also a Professor of Medicine and Endowed Chair in Cardiovascular Innovations, and he's a Director of the Advanced Cardiac Imaging, Lipid Clinic, and Infiltrative Disease Program. He, is, uh, he has over 300 publications, many abstracts, book chapters, and has lectured internationally on lipids and cardiac imaging. He is also the associate editor for the Journal of Clinical Lipidology, JCM, and is on the editorial board of various uh, big journals. It's a great pleasure to have you here today speaking about a subject that I think is very, very important and, and not offered covered. Thank you, Dr. Slipsuck, for the kind introduction. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you folks about uh, this disease, which I've been seeing, as you were discussing just before we got on, for almost a decade now. And just the amount of progress that's happened in this disease and other infiltrative heart diseases is uh, so amazing to watch. All right, so what is Fabry disease? Um, as most of you know, Fabry disease is a lysosomal storage disease, and it's the second most common one of those after Gaucher. Um, Fabry disease has actually been around, described uh, ever since 1898, uh, surprisingly by two dermatologists at the same time, one in Germany by the name of uh, Johann Fabre, and the other one was a British doctor uh, by the name of William Anderson. Separately in London, they both uh, described the disease at the same time. And that's why the disease is sometimes also called February Anderson disease. And so the description was initially based on finding a typical skin rash that's called angiokeratoma on um, two children that these two doctors saw separately. And at that time, they didn't know what caused the rash uh, and the genetic basis and the pathophysiology became evident much later. Uh, but ever since that time, it's been described as a multi-organ disease. And now, obviously, for the past two decades, we have uh, specific treatment for it. And it's really an exciting time in terms of impacting these patients' lives. So Fabry disease is a rare disease. Uh, it occurs uh, about uh, one in 40,000 males. Um, and I have to say the prevalence is, is quite variable and the numbers are so variable because the more genetic testing we do, the more we find it. But in terms of clinically manifest disease, it's not about one in 40,000 males, maybe one in 20,000 females. But as I mentioned, the estimates are wide in some of the literature you'll read, it might be as much as high as one in 200,000. And some of the newer literature coming out from countries that do routine genetic screening, it may be as high as one in 2,000 in uh, neonates. So very variable uh, disease uh, prevalence numbers. So lysosomal storage diseases in general or uh, diseases that typically present with neurodevelopmental delay. And they're caused because lysosomes have important enzymes. And when these enzymes are deficient, uh, they cause metabolic diseases with storage of the substrate within the cell. And so here you'll see several examples. Uh, there's about 50 or so described lysosomal diseases in humans. And I'm sure you've heard of most of these, glycogen storage diseases, Danon disease, mucopolysaccharidosis of various kinds, and then sphingolipidosis, which are basically uh, accumulations of carbohydrate macromolecules and lipid macromolecules. And within that falls anderson fabry disease. The reason we see these is because a lot of these present with cardiac manifestations. And the most common cardiac manifestation is increase in left ventricular wall thickness or left ventricular hypertrophy. I like to use the word increase in thickness rather than hypertrophy, because when you say hypertrophy, you're presuming that the increase in thickness is because of cardio uh, myocyte hypertrophy. And in some cases, it's not that. It's because of accumulation 
of just the macromolecule and there's no actual increase in myocyte uh, hypertrophy. So it's important to make that distinction. But in common nomenclature, you'll see LVH and that's okay for the most part. Now remember in Fabry disease, you not only get intracellular accumulation of fat, but you also get compensatory or reactive left ventricular hypertrophy. So here's a lysosome shown in these small green organelles. And lysosomes are essentially factories within a cell. And so their purpose is to digest macromolecules. And what happens in Fabry disease is that there's a deficiency of this enzyme, which we'll call alpha-galactosidase A, alpha-gal-A. And that leads to the buildup of the substrate, GB3, which then cannot be broken down in the lysozyme. And so because GB3 accumulates, eventually over time, it causes cellular accumulation and buildup, and that causes toxicity to the cell. You'll notice that the sphingomyelin pathway and the ceramide pathway has many enzymes that exist in lysosomes. And when those enzymes are missing, it causes all of these kinds of lysosomal storage diseases like Tay-Sachs, Gaucher, neiman pick et cetera. So this pathway is very important for cellular metabolism and lends itself to various inherited diseases. Now, there's a couple of different kinds of Fabry that we see clinically. Obviously, the severity of disease depends on how much of the enzyme is working. When you have less than 3% functioning enzyme, you get classic or type A disease that starts in infancy and symptoms appear very early on in childhood. And we'll talk about some of those symptoms. And then you have a late onset form, which is called type B or non-classic. And the late onset forms are more hard to recognize because they can manifest just with cardiac symptomatology or LVH or only with renal dysfunction. And the reason those are important is because sometimes you will see people who are 50s or 60s who develop LVH, and it's very hard to know without an antecedent history of classic symptoms that these people have February. So you have to have a very high degree of suspicion. In fact, there are case reports of people who've had myomectomies as well as septal reduction therapies, thinking that they had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then incidentally on the biopsy sample that was taken at the time of myomectomy, and that was run through uh, histology and genetic analysis, it became clear that these individuals actually had Fabry disease all along. So the later manifestation sometimes poses diagnostic challenges. And especially in Taiwan, where they do a lot of these neonatal screening studies, there's a particular kind of mutation that limits itself to a cardiac phenotype. And it's very common, about one in 1,400 of these individuals turn out to have Fabry disease. Not all of them have a 100% penetrance. Some of them will go through life without ever developing LVH. But it's important to note, that's why I said that the prevalence may be more than we think it is because we're not testing people systematically. So what does it look like on histology? Here's a, a biopsy of the kidney, and you will see that the uh, uh, maximal accumulation of this compound, GB3, occurs in vascular endothelial cells. So here's an arterial, here are the endothelial cells, and you'll see these GB3 accumulations shown here in blue. And so that's why you get arterial thickening. And in the kidney, the other place that accumulates is the portocyte. And so it, the portocyte is an important element of the nephron and portocyte dysfunction leads to leakage of protein. So these patients often have proteinuria leading to renal um, disease. And the second reason uh, they get uh, hypertension is because of accumulation of the GB3 inside the arterioles. So as I mentioned, um, it's a, a X-linked disorder. Uh, so that means that uh, the, the gene is present on the X chromosome long arm and multiple mutations have been described over 900 now. A lot of these mutations are uh, nonsense mutations. Some of them are frame shift or deletions. And then of course, anytime you do uh, testing very often as we're starting to do now because genetic testing is getting cheaper and more accessible, 
you will notice that you're starting to see what we call variants of unclear significance, whereas uh, whereas you have some mutation that could potentially be pathogenic because it alters the function of the protein, but you have to tie that in to the patient's history and clinical course and other evidence of organ dysfunction before you say that that individual has Fabry disease because it could just be uh, uh, and, uh, a mutation or, or a, a, a SNP that is non-pathogenic. Now, in males, uh, because they only have one X chromosome, um, they're called hemizygous, and they're obligatorily going to have disease. Whereas in females, uh, in the past, we used to think that females are only carriers and won't have disease at all. Well, some females never, never do develop symptoms, but in fact, the majority of females will develop some symptoms. It's generally true that females are affected to a less severe degree, but that's not always true. There are plenty of women who are affected just as severely as males. So that concept that women with Fabry disease uh, have a benign disease and will not be affected is not true. We have to watch out for symptoms and signs even in women and treat them if they develop that. Now, all of you probably remember from your medical school days, the uh, uh, genetic transmission of X-linked diseases. When a father carries the disease, has an abnormal X chromosome, he's going to pass it on to all of his girls, whereas that abnormal X chromosome will not go to the boys because they get the Y chromosome from the dad and the X chromosome comes from the mother. So this is what we call lack of transmission from father to son, which is classic for X-linked disorders. Now, what happens if the mother is affected? If the mother is affected, she has one normal uh, X chromosome and one X chromosome that carries the mutant gene. So that X chromosome will go on a 50-50 basis to every child, whether it's a boy or a girl. So both boys and girls have a 50-50% chance of being affected. Obviously, if the boys are affected, they will uh, obligatorily develop and show signs of the disease. If the girls are affected, they may or may not show signs early on. And that has to do with a concept called lionization or random X chromosome inactivation. In patients uh, who are women who are Fabre, uh, whether or not the X chromosome that carries the mutant gene is manifest in any organ depends on some random phenomenon. In some organs, it will uh, be manifest, i.e. the mutation will be impactful to that organ. And in some other organs of that same patient's body, the normal X chromosome carrying the normal gene will uh, produce the protein. So um, that's why the difference in disease severity between uh, different females in the same family carrying the same mutation. Now, the key organs involved in Fabre are the skin, which I talked about in my first slide, but so several other organs too, the peripheral nervous system. And one of the key symptoms that boys, when they're young, will experience is what we call acroparesthesias, which is a burning or shooting pain that occurs in the hands and feet. And these are some of the descriptions I've heard from patients, sandpaper all over my body, uh, uh, very, very sensitive skin at times, especially with fever or changes in temperature. So when these boys exercise or run or they're exposed to cold or heat, they have more of these acroparesthesias. Um, the other organ system involvement uh, is heart, which is why we're talking about this today, and we'll go into great detail about that. Central nervous system involvement, stroke, TIA, or white matter lesions. In fact, the neurology literature will suggest anytime you have a young person with a stroke, obviously we as cardiologists look for PFOs. So cryptogenic strokes, one should always look for Fabre also because it's an important cause of small vessel disease as I showed you the GB3 deposition in the small arterioles so it can cause cryptogenic strokes in young people. Kidney insufficiency, which we will talk about, and then GI disturbances. These are harder to uh, pinpoint because patients often have alternating diarrhea and constipation and episodes of uh, uh, stomach pain. Uh, abdominal pain. And in fact, when these children go to school, uh, 
uh, people will give them various diagnoses because it's very hard to diagnose uh, abdominal pain that comes and goes without any um, uh, pathology that you see on a CT scan or other functional testing. So these kids are given a diagnosis of malingering or other diagnoses such as fibromyalgia or um, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Just it's very hard to make the diagnosis if you don't have the classic uh, findings of Fabry. And there are some classic findings, which I'll show you in a second. In terms of organ system um, uh, involvement, uh, heart is involved in about 70% of cases. We talked about the peripheral nerves being involved, kidneys, eyes, and I'll show you some uh, pictures of what uh, eye involvement can happen, uh, skin condition, uh, brain, GI tract, and ear. And these are some of the uh, frequencies and symptoms you'll see. We talked about many of these. One important symptom that children notice is hypohydrosis. They have an inability to sweat. And this again has to do with autonomic dysfunction with their small nerves. And that causes heat uh, uh, and cold intolerance as well as uh, inability to exercise. So many of these kids don't uh, do well in sports. Um, uh, nephropathy we talked about. A lot of these individuals as they get older, they get hearing loss. And we talked about uh, cerebral vascular disease. One of the other things that you see on CT angiograms of these patients is they have ectasia of the basal artery, the so-called dolichoectasia. And then many of these individuals also get lymphedema. So a whole constellation of signs and symptoms. And the organ tropicity, uh, which organs they involve, depends on the mutation in some part. And especially in women, as I mentioned, the X-linked random inactivation. So a whole host of signs and symptoms. Many of these appear in childhood, such as the uh, episodic pain crises, acroparesthesias, the inability to sweat, uh, the corneal features, which I'll show you on the next slide, heat and cold intolerance. And then some of the features start to appear later on in life and up are fully manifest more in adulthood. For example, the cardiomyopathy, it starts in the 30s and then it progresses as people age. Whereas you'll notice that the renal failure, the proteinuria, uh, proteinuria starts in adolescence. And then by the time these individuals get to their 40s and 50s, they get ESRD. Similarly, stroke starts to appear in the mid 30s. And then as time progresses, people have more and more neurological symptoms. So this is the classic skin manifestation that the dermatologists had described, uh, Johannes Fabre and uh, uh, Anderson. Uh, these angiokeratomas, the small reddish, bluish, purplish papules, they don't hurt, they don't itch, but they're present in what we call a bathing trunk distribution, a swimming trunk distribution. So from the umbilicus to the tops of the thighs on both the back, the front, the buttocks, the scrotum, the abdominal wall skin. So they don't hurt, but they're cosmetically not pleasant to look at for people. So they try to get them lasered out, but they come back. Uh, and they're more common in men than in females. But if you look for them carefully, uh, you know, oftentimes we as cardiologists, we just listen to the heart, look for edema. So you really have to get the patient undressed or look for them or specifically ask for this. Otherwise, uh, I'm showing you florid examples. Sometimes I've seen tiny little angioperitomas just on the creases and nowhere else or on the scrotum. So you really have to carefully look for them. Sometimes the patients themselves may not be aware that they have them. The corneal findings are very classic, but again, um, this is only detectable by slit lamp. So this is called cornea verticillata, and it happens because of the fat deposition, GB3, which is a uh, glycosphingolipid deposits in the cornea. So it causes this sort of starburst appearance. And so you will not see this with your pen light. Uh, and so you really have to send these people to an ophthalmologist and you'll see this with a slit lamp. But once you see this, it is fairly pathognomonic. I shouldn't say it's 100% correlates with Fabry. There's some other diseases that do this, but uh, it definitely increases your suspicion that this person has Fabry. The other finding you'll see is this is the conjunctiva. You see these tortuosity of the conjunctival vessels, and this is a fundo uh, fundoscopy of the retina. You see the tortuosity of the retinal vessels also. Lenticular cataracts appear late, uh, and, and they're not uh, diagnostic, but they do happen 
are about 10 years earlier than age-related cataracts. Uh, but the lenticular cataracts, as you would imagine, they impair vision, but the cornea verticillata does not impair vision. So patients won't come to you saying that, you know, they can't see properly or they're floaters. They'll have zero symptoms. And unless you send them for a slip lamp and you find this uh, a typical finding, uh, it's not like the patient will be symptomatic from this. Now, nephropathy is an important element of the disease. Uh, it starts very early. So the first manifestation is proteinuria, which is sometimes I get referrals from nephrologists who have made the diagnosis because they were sent an individual who had a UA incidentally showed protein. They were doing a workup for uh, cryptogenic proteinuria, and then they happened to diagnose Fabry disease. And then obviously that developed cardiac disease and come to see me. But proteinuria is a very early manifestation. And so again, it's asymptomatic. Unless you do a UA, you're not going to, the patient's not going to have any symptoms. Uh, by the time they have symptoms of renal disease, it's obviously too late. Uh, males are affected more than females, like with many of the other manifestations. And as I mentioned, it's because of photocyte injury. Uh, ESRD occurs by middle age and men and female. Obviously, women tend to lag by about 10, 20 years for most of the organ pathologies. Um, now, in dialysis clinics, uh, uh, when they're routinely done either genetic testing or uh, biopsies, they've detected that 1% of all patients undergoing dialysis actually have a diagnosis of Fabry that was previously missed. And that can be missed, as I mentioned, because if they don't have all the classical symptoms, the acroparesthesia, the cornea verticillata, the angioperitomas, and they have a phenotype that's limited to the late onset or non-classic form, then they won't be much to go by to suspect a diagnosis, especially if they have developed hypertension as a consequence of Fabry. And there's a competing differential for why they develop renal disease, which is the hypertension. So you really have to have a degree of suspicion in these individuals or some other features that are present to be able to diagnose it. Same thing for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, when you have patients with HCM and you do routine genetic testing, which is quite common these days, you will discover that 1% of these individuals actually have Fabry, not uh, sarcomeric HCM. Renal disease is the second most common cause of death, and proteinuria is important because anytime you detect proteinuria, you can initiate treatment because it's a sign that there is a kidney involvement. So even if you have a five-year-old boy who's got proteinuria, that's an indication to start treatment. Hence, it's very important to look for it, and it can be slowed with enzyme replacement therapy. Now, how does one make the diagnosis? Obviously, one has to suspect Fabry first. And the hardest part about making the diagnosis is the clinician thinking that my patient may have Fabry. Once you suspect that I want to rule out Fabry, the rest of it is very easy. But the biggest uh, choke point is most physicians don't think of Fabry. Um, and if you, uh, once you think of it in a male, you can, you have two pathways to make the diagnosis. You can check for enzyme activity. Uh, and if the enzyme activity is low, you have a clear diagnosis, less than 3%. But in women, because the disease occurs later, manifests later, and they can have uh, random X inactivation, they may have some residual enzyme activity. So in women, we recommend that in order to make the diagnosis, you should go straight to gene testing first. You can obviously check their enzyme levels, but having a sort of minimally reduced uh, or, or moderate reduction in enzyme activity does not rule out uh, whether or not a woman may carry the disease because the penetrance of disease and the activity varies with age. So especially in younger girls who have a family history, you go straight to genetic testing, especially if you know what the proband has. So if a woman's mother has a known gene, many of these mutations are private, and you can test for exactly that same mutation. Nowadays, we have gene panels for cardiomyopathies. So, you know, you, you order a gene panel. Many of these are free because of the amyloid programs, et cetera, and they'll test for multiple uh, cardiomyopathy genes, about 100 to 200 of these. So Many of these will include testing for Fabry, 
but uh, there are some labs that do specialized testing for free. And so genetic testing should be offered for all patients, in my opinion. And then sometimes with the genetic testing, you come across variants of unknown significance. And if your patient's completely asymptomatic and you do a thorough search for whether or not there's some evidence of disease, and that can be an MRI of the brain, MRI of the heart, proteinuria, et cetera, symptoms, obviously. If you don't have any evidence that this patient is symptomatic at all or has any imaging or histological evidence, then you may have to resort to a biopsy, either skin biopsy or endomyocardial biopsy, whichever organ you think is the most likely to yield uh, some sort of uh, answer there. Those are the only individuals these days who need biopsy. Otherwise, most of the times you can make the testing by gene testing and by uh, looking at the enzyme activity. So the diagnosis is fairly straightforward. Unfortunately, there's still a big delay between when patients get symptoms and when the diagnosis is made. So shown here are males uh, and symptoms and boys start at age 11, diagnosis not made until age 25. Women uh, diagnosis, uh, symptoms starting at 22, diagnosis being delayed by about 16 years. And uh, in untreated populations, you'll see that there's quite a bit of decrease in survival, uh, more in males than in females. So the life expectancy is uh, definitely decreased. And most of these deaths are occurring because of cardiac causes. But once you start treatment, these curves actually get closer to each other. So cardiac disease uh, accounts for the majority of deaths, as I just mentioned. Um, cardiac events are increased threefold compared to the general population. Arrhythmias are very common, about in one third to one half of patients. A lot of patients get angina, not from epicardial disease, but from coronary microvascular dysfunction. Obviously, when you have GB3 deposition in arterioles, it impairs their function and you get microvascular ischemia. And then the majority of men will have some sort of cardiac symptom or event by the time they get into their 30s. And women, it lags by about 10 to 15 years, but the vast majority of them will develop some sort of cardiac referable symptom or sign. So for most people, uh, symptoms start in their 20s to 30s. This is a large survey called the Fabry Outcomes Survey. And you'll see that the treated patients uh, as well as the untreated patients uh, for both of them. Uh, once the symptoms start, you can obviously, uh, with, even with treatment, they keep progressing with time, but you slow down the progression with early treatment. So pathophysiologically speaking, uh, GB3 deposition occurs in every cell in the heart, myocytes, fibroblasts, smooth muscle cells, including vascular smooth muscle cells, conduction to the endothelium, the valves. So that leads to LVH, fibrosis, inflammation, and apoptosis. So these two features are new. In the past, we thought it was sort of an inert deposition disease, kind of like how we used to think about amyloid. But now we're just discovering none of these things is actually inert. They elicit an inflammatory response. So patients do have elevated high sensitivity troponins because it's a chronic inflammatory and deposition cardiomyopathy. And the apoptosis leads to cell death and fibrosis. So these are uh, important features of why the disease keeps progressing despite treatment sometimes. You do an endomyocardial biopsy on HNE, you will see vacuolization. This is fat deposits of GB3. You get interstitial fibrosis in between the myocytes as shown here in yellow. And then on electron microscopy, these fat deposits cause something called lamellar or myelin bodies. These are not typical just for Fabry. In the right context, obviously, they can be very, very helpful, but they occur in other lysosomal storage diseases also, and in some drugs, especially two of the cardiac drugs that you know mentioned here that we use, uh, 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 or you may see them in, in your patients, so including amiodarone. Now, the symptoms of Fabry for the heart uh, refer to uh, LVH, including papillary muscle hypertrophy and RVH, strokes, uh, arrhythmias, conduction system abnormalities, uh, HFPEF, which is a ventricular deposition, and atrial myopathy, which causes AFib and conduction system problems, including um, um, increased conduction time, as um, 
if patients get older. And then valve regurgitation is typically mild. So you won't see severe MR from Fabry, but you'll common, commonly see mild or moderate uh, MR and TR as a consequence of that. So I've listed most of those things over here. Systolic dysfunction is very uncommon. So just like all the other deposition diseases, like infiltrative diseases, uh, with the exception of sarcoid, which leads to systolic dysfunction earlier, Fabry, amyloid, et cetera, systolic dysfunction is a late feature, but heart failure is common. Um, you do also get aortic root dilatation in some of these individuals. Uh, and then bradycardia, especially as patients get older, is quite common. So a lot of these individuals need pacemakers and defibrillators, et cetera. So I've uh, shown you uh, echocardiograms of some of my patients. It's severe LVH. You know, one of the things about uh, older practitioners is every LVH to them turned out to be HCM. And while the rubric HCM is correct, you know, if you think about HCM, HCM doesn't mean sarcomeric HCM, at least how it's described in the European guidelines. It basically means increased wall thickness of some disorder after you've excluded hypertension. But I think a lot of HCM that people write in the charts, they presume it's sarcomeric HCM. So while Fabry is a kind of HCM, it's not properly correct to use the term uh, HCM for Fabry. It's an infiltrative disorder. It's a phenocopy of HCM, but it behooves you to look further to make the diagnosis. So Older echo literature will describe this sort of binary endocardial stripe in patients with Fabry. I've seen it in about 10 to 20% of echoes uh, with Fabry. You don't typically get SAM, although you can get asymmetric LVH even with Fabry. There's emerging literature saying that many of these individuals actually have asymmetric LVH, which confuses the picture more because a lot of your colleagues may be calling asymmetric LVH equals HCM unless proven otherwise. Well, now that you have genetic testing, uh, maybe you should uh, be, be sure and do genetic testing because Fabre, if you have the abnormal gene, you get a 100% hit rate. Uh, remember in HCM, you, you make uh, not all the genes that cause HCM are known to us, not all the mutations are known to us. So the hit rate is about 60% uh, and can vary depending on the phenotypic uh, kind of HCM, sarcomeric HCM, but in Fabre, we're lucky. If the patient has Fabry and has LVH as a consequence of that, and you do a genetic test, it will pick up the abnormal gene and the mut uh, abnormal mutation. Uh, then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, just as caution, not everything that's thick is uh, HCM. There are many others. Some of them are easy to exclude, like aortic stenosis, but sometimes you get challenges differentiating hypertensive heart disease from milder versions of these other disorders. And that's where things like mapping and strain become really important, which I'm going to talk about in a second. This is a wonderful paper from EHJ. It's old, uh, from Elliott in 2013. It talks about all these causes of thick hearts, including glycogen storage diseases, mitochondrial diseases, Noonan syndrome, uh, amyloidosis, et cetera. And I think I'll just point out that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is most common, one in 300 to one in 500. Uh, and these other diseases are rarer, but the age distribution is important. HCM can appear early on in, in the 20s, and most of these um, uh, amyloidosis is obviously a later stage disease, and Fabry generally appears in middle life. Uh, there are other types of uh, HCMs uh, with X-linked inheritance. Uh, two of them are Danon and a particular kind of sarcomeric HCM from FL, uh, FHL1 mutations. So the LVH in Fabre uh, is uh, one of the most important things you'll see. As I mentioned, sometimes HCM patients are misdiagnosed and they actually have Fabre. As I mentioned, it can be asymmetric LVH. Males are more commonly affected. And then LVH increases with age and it correlates with the occurrence of symptoms. If you see here, the patients who had LVH shown in blue uh, as opposed to ones who did not have LVH, i.e. genotype positive, but not yet phenotype uh, positive. Uh, the, the ones who have manifest LVH have more dyspnea or angina, as opposed to the ones who have not yet shown LVH on their echo. And then um, males, uh, once they uh, get LVH, 
uh, they're more likely to get LGE. So you'll, you'll see here males with hypertrophy, about 60% of them will get LGE, whereas females, for some reason that's not fully understood yet, will show LGE in 23% of cases, uh, even with, when they don't have LVH. So it's important to not exclude Fabry in a woman just because you look at the echo and say wall thickness is normal, or you look at the MRI and say, oh, no increase in wall thickness, so this can't be February. You have to do mapping or LGE to be able to determine that. The good thing about this is if you start treatment early, you will cause a decrease in LV mass index, and the LV mass index is a very strong prognostic feature in this disease. Uh, arrhythmias, as I mentioned, they can be all kinds of arrhythmias, but a typical feature of most of these infiltrative diseases is there's a short PR interval. So early on, that fat deposition actually makes the AV nodal conduction more slick. So you get a shorter PR and can actually make the B wave duration also uh, shorter. But as then eight people age, they get a conduction system problems, bundle branch blocks, AV block, pacemakers, in, in, including sudden cardiac death. Now, it's not as common as sarcoid. Uh, sudden cardiac death is relatively uncommon in these individuals, but the uh, indications of pacemaker and ICDs are the same. Uh, and so we, we do in, implant those in individuals who need it. A typical EKG, uh, very high QRS voltages, short PR intervals, P-wave inversion, and uh, you know, uh, we, we're taught all the time that amyloidosis will have low QRS voltage as opposed to the other diseases. Danon disease is the one with the highest QRS voltage, even more than HCM. Um, uh, but amyloidosis, it can also be normal. Remember that you cannot exclude amyloid if the QRS voltage uh, is okay. It, it's, uh, and the, P, the PQ interval is short in Fabry disease, as I mentioned. And the highest incidence of AV blocks occurs in amyloidosis, but Fabry disease is also quite common. Now we use strain because it's, a, uh, it's done commonly in all labs now, I hope. And uh, one of the walls to look for is this basal inferior lateral wall where the first uh, uh, deposition site in the heart. So uh, there's this report uh, in 2013 showing that longitudinal strain from this segment less than minus 0.25 uh, has a good accuracy. You can also use relative apical strain ratio. You'll see the apex is preserved because the deposition starts in the base and then progresses towards the apex, much like amyloid. So remember, when you see this apical sparing ratio, it is not pathognomonic for amyloid. You see it in other infiltrative cardiomyopathies and HCM also. But it can be very useful to lead you to further testing. This is what CMR shows. Uh, T1 maps, uh, because of the fat shown here in blue, the T1 values are low. Uh, the wall thickness is increased. Some of these individuals can have edema uh, as manifested on the T2 maps. And then, of course, uh, late gadolinium enhancement, classically seen in the mid myocardial segment in the basal inferior lateral wall. So these kinds of patterns in the uh, mid myocardium focal LG in the basal and lateral wall are quite suggestive. They're not pathognomonic, but they're very suggestive. Uh, so here's an example of LGE patterns and other thick hearts. Remember in hypertension, you typically won't have LGE. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it'll track with the areas that are the thickest. Uh, in Fabry disease, it's usually in the basal and lateral wall. Amyloidosis obviously is very diffuse and you have uh, difficulty with nulling. And in sarcoid, it's usually punched out and it's in the septum as well as in the lateral wall. So again, none of those is pathognomonic, but they're helpful pattern recognition tools. And as I mentioned, uh, T1 reduction is classic for Fabry because fat reduces the native T1. The other things that do that are iron, melanin, and obviously fat that can also occur in uh, either post-myocardial uh, metaplasia or just... Uh, deposition of fat uh, congenitally in the myocardium, which we see occasionally. So reduction in T1 in act is actually very helpful. So in uh, fabric cardiomyopathy, you may get T1s in the 800 to 900 range, normal being 960, whereas in other uh, phenocopies of HCM like amyloidosis, it can be very, very high. So that's very helpful. The other thing you'll see is that 
when Fabry disease patients don't have LVH, their T1s are not as low as when they do have LVH. So that, that's another important clue. And then as time progresses and they develop fibrosis in these regions, that T1, which was initially low because of fat, starts to climb up now because of fibrosis and then can actually become high. That's what we call normalization or pseudo-normalization. And as the disease progresses, you will see that the troponin levels go up, the anti-proBNP levels go up. And so those biomarkers can be very useful. The other biomarker we often look at is GB3 or lyso-GB3. And we use this to track disease activity and, and response to treatment. And you'll notice that in patients who have LVH and manifest disease, these biomarkers will be up. So the combination of biomarkers as well as imaging has really revolutionized how we see diagnosed disease, how we make decisions to treat, how we follow these patients. And so more and more data is emerging on using this combinatorial approach to see if our patients are doing okay or not. Because you can't just rely on symptoms for half path. You have to follow the disease pattern. And so here's a good chart that my fellow Omar put together talking about uh, T1 values. First they reduce, uh, then they go up, as well as late gadolinium enhancement uh, occurs during the later stages of the disease. Systolic dysfunction is very, very rare. It happens in the late stages. And uh, here's another good chart showing you the uh, transition from a storage phase uh, up to age about 20 or so to inflammation phase, and then finally fibrosis and uh, replacement phase. Coronary microvascular dysfunction, you can detect this using PET, uh, the flows are abnormal, and you can also detect it on adenosine stress CMR. So I routinely do uh, CMRs. Occasionally, I'll do stress CMRs for these individuals and calculate myocardial blood flow if they have angina. And that's another good way. You can combine everything in one study. You don't have to do a separate PET. Uh, you can do a stress CMR and get all the information you need, including mapping. Now, follow-up of disease, it just depends on whether or not your patient has symptoms. Uh, for all patients, we will follow, obviously, renal function, urine, creatinine, albumin, and GB3, uh, as well as uh, if they are on treatment, anti-drug antibodies. Because when you start enzyme replacement therapy, some of these individuals get anti-drug antibodies. And then you'll follow EKGs to look for any conduction system disease. If they don't have disease, you know, we'll screen them every three to five years with echocardiograms or sometimes MRI, depending on how strong their family history is and whether or not they're getting any symptoms. So these are all expert consensus documents. There's no level of evidence uh, A, class of recommendation one. There are actually no US guidelines for this. So a lot of this comes from experts who have put together how often we should do this. Uh, but it's just like HCM or uh, the other infiltrative cardiomyopathies. You know, you essentially screen people every six months or so if they have disease, if they're completely asymptomatic and they have not manifest disease, then every three to five years, it's okay. And you have, don't forget about the other exams, such as the ophthalmologic exam, uh, audiology exams, brain to look for white matter lesions and other consultations. Now, the, there is an international consensus panel guidelines that have come out in about 2016 to 2018. And so for boys, we tend to be more aggressive and we look for any disease anywhere, either histological evidence or imaging evidence or biochemical evidence. So you have proteinuria, as I mentioned, or you do a MRI and you see white matter lesions that are asymptomatic, or you get uh, an MRI of the heart and you see T1 map is abnormal. That's not specifically mentioned yet, T1 mapping, but more and more experts are using that as an indication to start treatment in the appropriate context. So if your T1's low and the patient has no other features and the strain's abnormal, that would compel me that this patient has symptomatic cardiac enrollment, especially if I do a whole try and detect uh, either AV block or some other condition. So uh, for symptomatic individuals, it's very easy. Anybody with symptoms, anybody with any features of manifest disease, including on imaging, you can start treatment. The problem occurs in the variants of unknown significance and the ones who are asymptomatic, because there you don't want to start patients on intravenous enzyme replacement therapy for life. If these individuals have a variant that's benign and it's not going to cause them problems, because there's downsides to treatment in that 
situation. So there you want to look for disease carefully or do a biopsy if you're very concerned that there is disease. And if you do have imaging evidence of disease, you can start treatment, uh, especially in males, because they tend to progress more rapidly. Other supportive management, remember that ACE inhibition is wonderful because it also helps proteinuria. A lot of these individuals, 80 to 90% of them will have hypertension, um, not just because of renal involvement, but also because of peripheral arterial involvement. If they have microvascular angina, then you can choose uh, dotaizem or verapamil. A lot of them have uh, a prior history of TI or stroke. They get antiplatelet, anticoagulant therapy. Hyperclogulability is more common for some uh, unclear reason, perhaps because of the vascular endothelial involvement. Dyslipidemia is also more common. So all of these undergo standard treatment. No specific data for SGLT2s and HEFPEF or HEFREP, but standard reasons to put in devices. Uh, many of these individuals have neuropathic pain, so they get those kinds of drugs antidepressants if needed, GI drugs if needed for uh, constipation and diarrhea, uh, hearing aids. Transplantation has been done, especially renal transplant. Uh, the clinical disease doesn't occur again in the donor kidney, but they still need to be continued on ERT for extra renal disease. And heart transplantation, there's only occasional case reports. So it's not really standard therapy, especially with the ERT we have these days. So how do I treat these patients? Uh, the most important thing is uh, enzyme replacement therapy with a galsidase beta is what's approved in the US since 2003. This is called Fabrozyme. It's an intravenous drug. Alpha is available in Europe and other parts of the world. There's a newly approved ERT called Pegruni galsidase, which I'll talk about. And then there's something very interesting called chaperone therapy. These are pharmacological chaperones. They're small molecules. This is an oral drug that goes to the lysosome and changes the conformation of the protein. Uh, so you have a mutant abnormal protein that's not working well because of altered four-dimensional conformational state, and it coaxes the protein to work by stabilizing it and changing the conformation. It's a really interesting concept in drug development and how we use these drugs. It essentially... Um, makes the patient's own mutant protein work better. Then substrate reduction therapy has been tried. This is uh, an attempt to reduce the production of GL3 from ceramide. And uh, these trials are still ongoing. They're not quite there yet. And then gene therapy looks very, very promising. So uh, I'm just going to few, uh, say a few words about Fabrozyme or galsidase beta. This is the most commonly used drug in the U.S. It's approved. Uh, for adults and children beyond age two. It reduces plasma and tissue levels of GL3, shown here as an example of the, of the kidney in somebody with pre-treatment, post-treatment. It also does the same thing in the heart and the skin. But if you have to start it early, if you start it too late, it won't prevent ESRD or strokes. But start it early, you can regress LVH and cardiac disease. I'm not gonna spend too much time on the other drugs. This just got approved last month. Uh, it's, put, it's, it's made from a plant-based expression system, again, IV, given every two weeks. And uh, the hope is that it can be dosed every month instead of every two weeks. This is an oral chaperone that I talked about. Uh, it's taken every other day. And, uh, but the problem here is it's only good for about 40 to 50% of patients who have an amenable mutation. And so it doesn't work for everybody. Um, but the data looks good in terms of uh, reduction and worsening of kidney function. Gene therapy is a lot of promise. There's this one drug that is perhaps the most advanced uh, in clinical trials at this moment. These are adenoviral-based gene therapies. So you take uh, the patient's own stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells, and you integrate them into an adeno adenoviral vector that's been inactivated, and you infuse it back into the patient's body. It's just done once in the lifetime, and uh, that goes to the hepatocyte or cardiomyocyte, depending on how you structure the viral capsid, and it uh, uh, then allows the patient's own cells to produce alpha-gal. And so this, you know, there's a lot of hope on this, and hopefully this will work out. There's plenty of uh, gene uh, uh, compounds and evolution, and we'll see where this goes. So there are no head-to-head -head treatments, and so 
depending on whether you choose IV or PO, it depends on your patient. Uh, IV obviously is inconvenient, but it really works well and it prevents uh, end-stage renal disease and uh, uh, cardiac disease. So I'm going to skip some of these slides in the interest of time so I can take your questions. So in conclusions, um, if you see somebody with acroparesthesias, hypohidrosis, or any of these things, unexplained LVH, please make the diagnosis of uh, Fabry because once you consider it, it's easy. Cardiac involvement is the most important cause of morbidity and mortality. Echo and MRI can be very helpful and early treatment uh, looks uh, is very helpful to our patients. So I'll stop there and um, take questions from you guys. Thank you so much. That was an amazing lecture and so so many so much information and and from internal medicine to cardiology treatment. Uh, I loved it. Um, so uh, we'll open for questions. Please put your questions in the in the Q A and and we'll go through them. Uh, I'll start with one question. Obviously, the the big problem here is uh, that we're not identifying these patients probably uh, frequent enough. And just wanted to know your thoughts on that. Do you think like he having HEFF uh, clinics would help for this? Do you think it's the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Where do you think is the entry to the system for these patients? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and your point's very well taken, not just for this disease, but also for, say, amyloid. You know, the push is get the clinician to first consider the diagnosis. So everybody gets an echo with HEFF. And uh, I think strain should be mandatory. I think most of the academic labs are doing strain because it gives you the first index that this is not just hypertension. Something else is going on. If you have an abnormal strain, then you obviously go down the pathway of workup of uh, uh, some sort of infiltrative or other cardiomyopathy. And these days, genetic testing is becoming so easy to do, so high yield, I strongly encourage people to incorporate that into their practice. Not, not when you have a straight, you know, straightforward hypertensive heart disease patient. There you have your diagnosis. There's something's amiss, consider that. The other slide I didn't show is genetic testing. Uh, uh, some states, um, for example, Taiwan does it in everybody. Uh, and some states uh, in the US, it's a mandatory screening program, including Illinois, where I used to be before. We don't do it in Kentucky, but you know that's sort of the way this is going. And that way, it's like a disease that always gets diagnosed. So hopefully we'll get to that point. That's great. And what are the, what's the cost of therapy nowadays? It's, it's still quite expensive. Um, you know, it's uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for, for uh, but it's covered. Um, and so um, it, it it definitely, if you think about the cost of dialysis or cost of, you know, uh, 20 years of life saved, I think from that viewpoint, it can be very helpful. Um, as I mentioned, there's now this progress towards uh, giving infusions less often, as well as gene therapy, which will perhaps be, in my opinion, be the most cost-effective op uh, option of all. So therapy is effective, but if you look at uh, other uh, lysosomal storage diseases and um, other genetic diseases, it's actually one of the cheaper ones comparatively. Yeah, obviously that's, that's with more therapies that will probably get better. Yeah. Um, and we, we have no questions, so I'll, I'll ask you one more, even that I have sure. the, the opportunity. So what are your thoughts on using cardiac MRI for monitoring therapy? Do you think there's a role in that? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a little bit biased, but the data that's coming out, so you know how it is in our field, Yandro, it takes about five to 10 years of collecting data before guidelines can endorse it. But for the people who are doing this on the front line, we're seeing changes, um, obviously for making the diagnosis, but even for a fine tuning treatment where you can see rapid progression of T2, uh, or uh, decline in T1 or fibrosis. And so I have, on, in, in individual cases, uh, you know, change therapy uh, or exhorted people to get back on therapy because we're seeing abnormal findings. And that's not just true for this disease. It's also true for amyloidosis. Now, there's obviously lots of case reports. But I would be remiss if I didn't say that that's not guideline recommended today. 
it's sort of the cutting edge of what we're doing. We're accumulating more data. We definitely see signals in T1, T2, ECV, fibrosis, and whether every patient needs that, I guess if they're stable and doing well, then they don't. But for the ones where you feel like things are progressing very rapidly or your patient gets soft therapy or can't tolerate therapy and you're thinking of convincing them to start the oral therapy instead of the intravenous, et cetera, all of those things that can be really helpful. And for monitoring, you have somebody who's a pro band and their children, which happens all the time, are reluctant to start treatment. You know, a 14 year old boy who's like, well, I, I wanna wait until I'm 30 or 40 before I start treatment. And they're not concerned that they have a little bit of proteinuria. But if you show them that there's disease in the heart on MRI, then they're more convinced that, oh boy, I got, I have, you know, deposition in my heart, so I, I should start treatment. So that's where the field is going. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any registries on imaging for this that, that you're aware? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Kate Hanneman from uh, Toronto uh, has a, a wonderful registry. And uh, we have, you know, our own patients that we're following. Um, the Fabrate Outcome Survey is a big clinical registry, and they have a subset that they're doing imaging also on. So um, it's a big global effort to uh, track these people more carefully, especially now that we're, you know, doing uh, uh, gene therapy trials. Uh, that's going to be really interesting to see what sort of an impact that has on imaging. For sure. Well, thank you very much. This was a wonderful lecture, and, and thank you for taking the time and spending your lunch time with us. My pleasure. And again, thanks for the invite. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.